morning. It's April 16th here in Seoul, and I'm Peunzi. We begin with these stories making the headlines at this hour, starting with the escalating crisis in the Middle East. Following an unprecedented attack by Iran over the weekend, Israel is reportedly planning a painful retaliatory strike on Iran that would not lead to a wider regional war. It also appears to be looking for a way that won't be blocked by the U.S., after Washington announced that it would not support an Israeli counterattack. The U.S. government has announced that it will provide more than $6 billion to Samsung Electronics to boost chipmaking in the country. This is the third largest subsidy announced by Washington, as the Biden administration works to drive up domestic chip manufacturing amid the U.S.-China rivalry. Former U.S. President Donald Trump's historic criminal trial has begun in New York. Before entering court, Trump said the trial was nonsense and an assault on America. After Iran's drone and missile attack on Israel over the weekend, Israel is reportedly considering painful retaliation that would avoid escalating into a full-scale war. Iran also claims it gave a warning before attacking Israel, but the U.S. says it did not get the warning and that Iran was aiming for significant damage. Our Shin Ha-young starts us off. Israel's war cabinet met on Monday to discuss how to respond to a direct attack from Iran against a country overnight on Saturday. According to Israeli media outlet Channel 12, Israel is weighing up retaliation options that are intended to be painful to Iran, but without causing an all-out war in a way that coordinates with allies, including the U.S. Following the attack at the weekend, U.S. President Joe Biden warned that Washington would not participate in any counteroffensives launched against Iran and would only continue to assist in defending Israel after it helped to shoot down most of the missiles launched on Saturday alongside other allies. During the meeting, the Israeli cabinet reportedly agreed on a strong response to make it clear that Israel does not tolerate Iran's recent attacks. We are considering our next steps and this launch of so many missiles, cruise missiles and drones into Israeli territory will be met with a response. Meanwhile, Iran said it gave notice to neighboring countries and the U.S. days before it attacked Israel, but the U.S. denied the claim. But there was never any message to us or to anyone else on the time frame, the targets or the type of response. White House National Security Council spokesman John Carby said that Washington is working with G7 countries on new multilateral sanctions to target Iran's missile programs. He added that G7 countries that had yet to designate the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps as a terrorist organization are now considering doing so. Pentagon Press Secretary Patrick Ryder on Monday reiterated remarks made earlier by U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, emphasizing a desire to avoid escalation in tensions while affirming the commitment to protect its forces in the region and defend Israel. According to a report by CNN, Israel was set to launch a ground offensive in Gaza's southern city of Rafah, but the plans were paused after Iran's weekend attack. Shin Ha-young, Arirang News. Following the unprecedented attack, the international community was quick to respond. The UN Security Council held an emergency meeting over the weekend in New York, where there was a major face-off between ambassadors from Iran and Israel. Our Kim jong sil reports. An emergency meeting upon the urgent request of Israel took place on Sunday local time at the UN headquarters in New York. Ambassadors from Iran and Israel both appeared, with Iran claiming the justification of its military strikes on Saturday, saying it only targeted military objectives and were carried out carefully to minimize the potential for escalation. Iran's operation was entirely in the exercise of Iran's inherent right to self-defense, as outlined in Article 51 of the Charter of the United Nations and recognized by international law. The Israeli ambassador to the UN, on the other hand, strongly condemned Iran, saying he has warned continuously and asked the Security Council to take concrete action against Iran's Ayatollah regime. Iran, the number one global sponsor of terror, has exposed its true face as the destabilizer of the region and the world. 
UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres called for maximum restraint, saying now is the time to defuse and de-escalate. The Middle East is on the brink. It's time to step back from the brink. It's vital to avoid any action that could lead to major military confrontations on multiple fronts in the Middle East. Most member countries, including South Korea, have urged all parties concerned to come up with measures to prevent further escalation. Kim Jong-sil, Arirang News. Like we just heard, Iran's massive aerial attack on Israel marked a new chapter in a conflict between the two states that has percolated for years and spiraled since Israel declared war on Hamas last October, as this was the first time that Iran carried out strikes against Israeli territory. For more on this, we're joined by Professor Mason Ritchie, Professor of International Politics at Hankook University of Foreign Studies. Welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Good morning. So what's the reason behind Iran's unprecedented attack on Israel? What was their intention? Uh, so the, the proximate uh, reason is that uh, on April 1st, uh, uh, Israel carried out uh, a strike against uh, Iran's uh, consulate annex in Damascus, Syria. Uh, uh, an annex that uh, was apparently used by the Iran Revolutionary Guard Corps. Uh, and uh, among the people that were killed there was Brigadier General um, Mohammed uh, Zahedi, uh, who was responsible or one of the people responsible for helping plan the October 7 uh, terrorist attacks uh, last year, uh, in which 1,200 uh, Israelis, um, the vast majority of them uh, innocent civilians, um, were killed. Uh, and so Iran uh, has launched this attack uh, against Israel as a response uh, to that uh, attack by Israel, that retaliatory uh, attack by Israel uh, against uh, General Zahedi. Uh, this is a real change uh, in some respects. Um, you know, you, we read in the in the news reports, uh, you know, a game changer or a sea change. Uh, in the sense that uh, Israel seems to have moved from, you know, primarily when it uh, aims at I Iranians, uh, it's done so in terms of killing proxies uh, abroad. Uh, and in this case, uh, they've chosen to directly eliminate uh, an Iranian uh, member of the military leadership. And so that's uh, that's a change. What, what Iran's response uh, is, I'm not quite sure in the first place. It's clearly, you know, just a, a message of retaliation uh, that, you know, Iran considers itself a grand country, uh, a great, you know, regional power and simply isn't going to stand by while one of its generals is killed. Uh, they may also, for all I know, be trying to distract Israel or perhaps you know, fan a broader war uh, in the Middle East. Uh, and it might also be part of their strategy to try to split uh, Washington and uh, Jerusalem. Right, and Israeli officials have reportedly said the country's war cabinet favors retaliation against Iran. And it's also said it will respond to Iran's attack when time is right. So when and how will Israel be responding to the attack and what can we expect to happen next? Uh, I do not know the answer to those questions. Um, I don't think anybody, uh, perhaps you know, outside of uh, Israel and, and perhaps uh, Washington, knows the answer to those questions. Um, you know, I think that uh, you know Israel's response, uh, you know, could include a direct response uh, against targets in Iran. That would, of course, be uh, escalatory. That would be highly provocative, and that's clearly not something that the United States wants. And I think the, that the United States is going to put pressure on, on Israel not to do that. So if I were guessing today, I would assume that the response is going to be a strike against uh, Iran-linked targets uh, in Syria or in Lebanon. Uh, that would be my guess. Um, and when that's going to happen, you know, the reports that we're hearing are uh, that this is going to take place imminently. Uh, and you know what that means is again an open question. Uh, you know it could be very soon. It could be a few days. It could be delayed. Uh, you know Iran is uh, excuse me Israel is going to choose uh, the time uh, for its attack that works for it uh, when it has the targets uh, that it wants. Uh, and ultimately, you know, when I think it can, it, it believes that it can do so uh, largely with the support of the United States, because it would be, uh, you know, somewhat difficult for Israel to push too far past what the United States is willing to countenance. Right. Like you just said, the United States does not want this to 
escalate into a wider war. And, it actually, and the Biden actually said it will not take part in any counterstrike against Tehran. So can the U.S. and its allies prevent the situation from escalating into a wider regional war, in your opinion? Um, my guess is yes, um, simply because, uh, you know, the United States does have, uh, you know, pretty significant leverage um, over Israel uh, in terms of intelligence sharing, in terms of uh, military support, in terms of diplomatic support. Um, you know, the relationship between Joe Biden and Benjamin Netanyahu is not very good, um, but Israel doesn't, you know, doesn't have the luxury of, uh, of having a president right now uh, in the United States who 100 support, 100 percent supports the things that Israel might like to do um, in this situation. Uh, this is, of course, especially important for, for Joe Biden right now. Uh, heading into a general election in November, where the last thing that he wants uh, is uh, to be blamed for uh, a large uh, regional Middle East war. So I think the United States is going to put significant pressure on Israel to keep its response to Iran contained. That's my guess. I could be wrong. Uh, we're in an incredibly dangerous uh, and, and very difficult time right now. Passions are high in Israel. Um, they are still extremely upset about what happened, uh, justifiably upset about what happened last October 7. Uh, and Iran, of course, as we know, it was in some form behind that. And so, you know, Iran's going to want to hit harder than the United States is, is willing to uh, countenance. And I don't imagine that Iran uh, would go much farther than what the United States would want, but it's a little bit um, hard to say at this moment. Right. And how will the escalating crisis in the Middle East affect the world economy and the global political landscape? Well, politically, you know, this is just one more problem that we don't need. Uh, you know, we have obviously the war in Ukraine, um, you know, which continues uh, apace uh, and tensions in the South China Sea. Uh, and, you know, this broader Middle East war is simply, you know, not something that, that we should want, um, obviously. Uh, so that's obviously a potential risk. Uh, on the economic side, uh, financial markets are, of course, going to be affected. Uh, oil prices uh, will be affected. They'll probably be pushed up probably a little bit less than it would have been, you know, somewhat significantly, in fact, less than it would have been affected, you know, back in the, let's say, the 1970s or, or even the 1980s and 90s. Uh, because the oil market um, has, has changed so dramatically with their other producer countries coming online besides those in the Middle East. Uh, but one would imagine that oil prices would increase or hydrocarbon prices in general may increase. Uh, financial markets will become unstable. Um, obviously, this will continue to fan uh, the uh, maritime shipping uh, issues that are taking place in the Red Sea with the Houthi rebels, uh, you know, who have been uh, attacking ships and making shipping difficult. So this isn't going to contribute to that resolving itself anytime soon. Uh, so essentially, none of the outcomes uh, here are good. All right, I guess we'll have to see where this goes. All right, Professor Ishii, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Great, thanks for having me. The U.S. government announced Monday that it'll give Samsung Electronics up to 6.4 billion U.S. dollars in grants to support the tech giant's chip-making investment in the U.S. It marks the third largest grant given under the U.S. Chips Act. Lee seung has more. The U.S. government announced on Monday that it has decided to provide up to 6.4 billion U.S. dollars in subsidies under the U.S. CHIPS Act to Samsung Electronics, which is investing in a high-tech semiconductor production facility in Taylor, Texas. In line with the grant announced by Washington, Samsung Electronics will invest $17 billion to expand the size and investment target of the semiconductor manufacturing plant under construction, with a total of approximately $45 billion in investment by 2030. Under the proposed investment in Taylor, the South Korean tech giants will construct a comprehensive advanced manufacturing cluster, including two leading-edge logic foundry fabrications, a research and development fab, and an advanced packaging facility. The $6.4 billion in subsidies given to Samsung Electronics is the third largest to date. American semiconductor company Intel is set to receive $8.5 billion, followed by Taiwan's TSMC, which will receive $6.6 .6 billion. 
$39 billion worth of incentives were put aside under the terms of the U.S. CHIPS Act to encourage chipmakers to build, expand, or improve semiconductor facilities in the U.S., with the Commerce Department looking to invest some $28 billion of the total sum in chipmakers like Samsung Electronics. This comes as the Biden administration has been pushing for initiatives to drive up domestic chip manufacturing amid the U.S.-China rivalry. Investments being made by major chipmakers, including Samsung, will put the U.S. on track to deliver on its plan to produce around 20 percent of the world's leading-edge logic chips by 2030. Lee seung Arirang News. Moving on to the latest in the standoff between the government and doctors. For the first time since the general election, the government has reiterated its commitment to expand the medical school admission quota, while trainee doctors are accusing the government of an abuse of power. Our Song Yoo-jin has more. It seems there's still a big hurdle to overcome in the standoff between the Korean government and trainee doctors regarding the expansion of the medical school admission quota. During Monday's Central Disaster and Safety Countermeasures Headquarters meeting, Health Minister Cho Kyu-hong said the government's will for medical reform remains unchanged. This includes a planned increase in the medical school admission quota by 2,000 from next year to tackle the country's shortage of doctors in essential medical fields and rural regions. We'd urge the medical community to stop their collective action and promptly engage in dialogue. We have a tight timeline considering the college admission schedule for 2025. The college admission guidelines for the 2025 academic year will be finalized next month, including the medical school quota. Making changes to the quota after that will be impossible. While standing firm on the expansion, the minister mentioned the government's openness to discussing rational and unified alternatives, echoing its previous stance, which hinted at the possibility of adjusting the scale of expansion. However, trainee doctors remain strongly opposed to the expansion. 1,360 trainee doctors who have submitted their resignation letters announced on Monday that they would file a complaint against Minister Cho and Second Vice Health Minister Pang min with the Corruption Investigation Office for high-ranking officials for alleged abuse of power and obstruction of the exercise of rights. They're saying the government misused its power to block hospitals from processing their resignation letters and force them to work against their will by issuing return-to-work orders. One of the seven requests trainee doctors made to the government to return to work in February was the complete removal of the expansion plan. Song Yujin, Arirang News. Washington says Pyongyang can genetically engineer biological military products, adding that the regime has a dedicated national-level offensive biological weapons program. According to an annual report issued by the U.S. State Department on Monday in consultation with the Department of Defense, Department of Energy, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff, North Korea uses technologies such as CRISPR to genetically engineer biological products. Last year's report indicated that the regime had at least a limited capability to genetically engineer biological products. The report further warned that the North has the capability to produce biological agents for military purposes and can create bacteria, viruses, and toxins that could be used as biological weapon agents. Good morning, I'm Kim Siang, and now we turn off to stories from around the world. Former U.S. President Donald Trump, who is once again running for the White House, began his unprecedented criminal trial on Monday in New York. On the first day of the trial, the court found difficulty in selecting jurors as over half of potential jurors were ruled out over concerns they couldn't be impartial. 60 out of 96 potential jurors quickly announced that they could not be impartial. Those who were left were then asked to answer 42 questions in the jury questionnaire, including what news media they read and whether they were supporters of Trump. Trump has been charged with falsifying business records to cover up a $130,000 U.S. dollar payment made out to former porn star Stormy Daniels just ahead of the 2016 election to buy her silence over an alleged sexual encounter in 2006. While Trump kept quiet during the entirety of the morning court proceedings, with yes being the only word he spoke, 
The former president spoke to reporters before entering the court, saying the trial was nonsense and an assault on America. In Sydney, Australia, a 15-year-old boy has been arrested after at least four people, including a bishop, were stabbed at a church on Monday. Local police reported that none of those stabbed had life-threatening injuries. The stabbing happened during a Monday evening service at the Christ the, God, the Good Shepherd Church in Wakeley, a suburb of Sydney. Police were seen trying to control large crowds gathered at the church who demanded for the attacker to be brought outside. The church service was being live-streamed online and was still being broadcast while the bishop was stabbed giving a sermon. Monday's knife attack comes only three days after a mass stabbing in a Sydney mall killed six people. Extreme rainfall, flash floods and thunderstorms have left more than 60 people dead over the past four days in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Heavy flooding due to seasonal monsoon rains killed at least 33 and injured 27 others by Sunday in Afghanistan, while thunderstorms and heavy rain killed at least 36 people in Pakistan. A Taliban spokesperson for the State Ministry for Natural Disaster Management confirmed that almost 20 out of Afghanistan's 34 provinces were affected by extreme monsoon rains, with 6, 600 houses heavily damaged and 200 livestock killed. In neighboring Pakistan, the country's southwest declared a state of emergency on Monday. Authorities in the country said most of the 36 deaths were farmers who were killed by lightning strikes and collapsed houses. Global automotive and energy company Tesla is planning to lay off more than 10% of its global workforce in order to cut costs. After reporting poor first quarter sales, Tesla CEO Elon Musk circulated an email to Tesla staff on Sunday saying that while there was nothing he hated doing more, job cuts must happen. According to Tesla's latest annual report, the world's biggest automaker by market value had just over 140,000 employees globally last December, meaning layoffs could affect some 14,000 staff members. Good morning. It's a cloudy and wet start to the day for central regions. Scattered showers will soak central parts of the country through the afternoon. It could rain less than 5 millimeters with strong winds, but rain could be mixed with yellow dust. So make sure to have an umbrella with you even though rain is spotty. Northwesterly winds will bring yellow dust into the country, boosting dust levels to bed or even very bad in the afternoon. Now we're kicking off the day in the low teens, then highs will go up 1 to 5 degrees, higher than yesterday, so we're topping out at 19 degrees, Daegu, Gyeongju, see a high of 24 degrees Celsius. Cloudy skies will turn much sunnier as the day goes on, but remember, a face mask is a must. Just when fine spring weather tries to make its comeback, yellow dust will make us choke in dust clouds. Meanwhile, sunny skies stay with us as the warming trend continues through the end of the week. That's Korea for you, and here's a look at the international weather conditions. That wraps up today's New Day at Arirang. Thank you for watching. We'll bring you more updates at the same time tomorrow.
둘, 셋. Hey, Mr. p e e p l e s Make sure you listen to what I say. I may be stupid or quite naive. 끝없이 쏟아지는 포터스파 휴대폰 한 대로 감당할 수 있겠니? 한국에 오면 먹어야죠 먹어도 먹어도 끝이 없는 나라 감당할 수 있겠니? 엄청난 에너지를 춤으로 뿜어내는 나라 감당할 수 있겠니? 한국에 오면 먹어야죠. 먹어도 먹어도 끝이 없는 나라. 감당할 수 있겠니? 하나, 둘, 셋. Hey, Mr. p e e p l e s p l e Make sure you listen to what I say. I may be stupid or quite naive. 끝없이 쏟아지는 포터스파. 휴대폰 한 대로 감당할 수 있겠니? 24시간 불이 꺼지지 않는 나라 감당할 수 있겠니? 
we're here to make a new type of news. New insights, new style, and new topics every day. We are News Generation. Making news just for you. It's April 16th here in Seoul. I'm Sun and you're watching News Generation. Joining me in the studio is Cheska Dain Hong. Happy Tuesday, everyone. Happy Tuesday. <laughs> and Park Won-woo. Great, great to be here. Great to have you back again. Now, both are here to speak on behalf of people in their 20s and 30s. As usual, let's start with our news feed, which covers different hashtags and news items that have been trending on social media over the past 24 hours. Hong Kong regulators on Monday have given the green light to the launch of Spot Bitcoin and Ether Exchange traded funds. China AMC, Harvest Global, Global and Bocera International are among those that have received approval. Back in 2021, China had a massive crackdown on crypto trading and effectively banned the practice on the mainland. However, Hong Kong has been trying to make itself into a regulated crypto hub to keep up with competitors in Dubai and Singapore. It's still unclear whether mainland Chinese investors will be allowed to take part, though. South Korea's rising food prices are affecting its fried chicken. According to the local franchise industry on Monday, nine chicken brands have decided to raise their price by over a dollar. Global brand Popeyes also raised the average price of its menus by 4%. For menus that have delivery options, prices went up by 5%. Experts believe this is mainly due to the rise in ingredient prices, namely cocoa and sugar. And the number of people who registered premium imported cars as their company cars has dropped significantly since the government implemented green license plates. Last month, the number of imported corporate cars surpassing $57,000 in price dropped by 31.4% on year. And from this year, the government has mandated all corporate owners who buy such luxury cars or supercars to use green license plates rather than white ones to prevent companies from dodging taxes. An automobile industry expert said few customers or business owners owners seem to prefer to purchase vehicles with green plates now because a negative image has been formed on rental or lease cars. Now here in the studio, I would like to ask first our business correspondent, Konu, on what you think about this new phenomenon. Yes, so from thinking from the business aspect and also as you just mentioned, the data shows that these imported cars saw an on-year decrease of about 30%. So that's a huge thing. And then I think this could possibly lead to more um, customers not buying these imported cars. And especially that is because some people are saying that these green license plates are not their style and it's not appealing and um, it's actually degrading the appearance of their expensive supercars. And one thing I also witnessed was that some people are also using tricks in order to dodge these regulations, mm. and uh, such as like lowering the acquisition value of those cars temporarily on their contracts. So I think we, we'll just have to see how this regulation uh, further goes on and then how effective it will, it will be at the end of the day. Right, so we're already seeing loopholes to this latest policy. And also, you mentioned a great point there. I do think a lot of corporate owners now understand that the public has is scrutinizing whether your car has a green license plate or not, which is making them hesitant as to buying expensive supercars. Now, Tesco, what do you think about this latest trend? I really agree with the last point that you made, Ian. Yeah. I think this law, the fact that there was so much decrease and change in the numbers of green plate cars show that previously some people have been abusing the law to get these supercars or perhaps unnecessary luxury cars that might not aid to the business in and of itself. Mm -hmm. So I think the number itself shows the effectiveness of the law in place and I do hope that the law kind of upgrades itself so if there are any loopholes that people can abuse mm -hmm. to satisfy their own need in terms of business growth, it also kind of gets cracked down on it as well. Yeah. And it's quite nice to see that the government is implementing different policies so that we don't see tax tax evasion happening, exactly. or corporate owners actually making the right choices mm -hmm. and not trying to use the law for their benefit. Now, switching gears to our main discussion topic of the day now, we talked about business, and pop-up stores are among the hottest destinations for millennials and Gen Zers these days. So we're going to start our discussion by first finding out what exactly pop-up stores are and how popular they seem to be mm -hmm. among our generation. Yes, so pop-up stores really came into the limelight in COVID-19 mm -hmm. and sort of gained the popularity, and I think it has sustained for a very long time. And one of the things that is quite interesting is that the range kind of goes very far wa wide and far in terms of starting with like IT technology, um, food and beverages. I even saw like some pet store product <laughs> that were doing a pop-up store and of course cosmetics. I saw a lot of environmental friendly products as well and another thing that really I think brought pop star uh, pop-up stores is the K-pop industry. Mm. So we have seen luxury brands really go for it but also when K-pop stars come up with new albums 
they do a lot of these pop-up store promotions. And one of the things that I love about going to pop-up store is it's almost like an information dense, sort of like an exhibition. It's very concise, but you also get these really engaging activities that you get to go to, and Connor will explain a bit more later. Mm -hmm. But I think it provides a very interactive, but also an informative time for the consumers to get to know more about the brand. And you mentioned a great point there. Pop-up stores not only are informative, but they're really interactive. Mm -hmm. You get the full experience, you get to learn about a brand, try out their latest products, take pictures. And Connor, would you like to elaborate on how popular they seem to be at the moment? Yeah, so um, Jessica mentioned mostly everything about these pop-up stores. Mm -hmm. and. Um, as she mentioned, it's not just limited to these luxury brands and just K-pop idol um, album promotions, but all industries from all directions, like food, desserts, mm -hmm. um, cosmetics, and even alcoholic beverages, um, they are all diving into these pop-up stores due to their high popularity. Right, and Konu, because we have you on our episode because you are a business correspondent and you recently did a coverage on the popularity of pop-up stores, so why don't you walk us through what you found out through your report? Of course, yeah, so to tell you more about um, what I found out. According to one staff member at a Pablo store that I visited, around 1,000 people visit these Pablo stores daily in average, and around 70% of those visitors are Zalpha generations, mm -hmm. um, which is a compound word of Gen Z and Alpha generation. And the reason why I'm also focusing on these Alpha generation is because um, the, mille the people that, um, the millennials who became parents now ha might have some children who are the Alpha generation. And um, they bring those children to these pop-up stores. So that's um, leading to a high popularity of these pop-up stores. And let's take a listen to what two Gen Zers had to say about their visit. I go to pop-up stores once or twice a month with my boyfriend as a date or with my friends to experience something fun. It's great to know what kind of products companies sell and what I can experience through pop-up stores. I go to these stores quite a bit if I see them on social media and they look fun as I can try different foods and experience different things within a short space of time. So, Konu, those were actual Gen Zelfers, right? Yeah. <laughs> Gen Z so and many Alphas. New <laughs> exactly, so many new lingo. Basically, they're young adults who love going to pop-up yes, stores, exactly. and I think they mentioned it perfectly as to why they were there. But, Cheska, would you like to elaborate on why you personally think that mm. our generation loves visiting these stores? I mean, I love them, so I, know. <laughs> I don't know if I fall into Zelfers, but as we heard from the interviews, pop-up stores have become incredibly interactive. Mm. I don't know if you saw from the interviews, but they seem to have these games and activities right. in the backgrounds. So surprisingly in Korea we have a somewhat limited activity options because we're very centralized in a city ecosystem so when they have these interactive engaging even active entertainment mm. I think it instantly gains popularity and also when you have the word limited in the title I think it definitely piques curiosity and also attractiveness I mean I for one when I see limited time only I kind of have to rush there right and another thing is I think um, our generation loves to mm. use social media I think we're all part of the generation and one of the things that pop-up stores do really great is mm -hmm. there's so many photo taking opportunities exactly and I think it goes vice versa the pop-up stores use social media to advertise and mm -hmm. attract customers and I think our generation just love news but also new things new things mm -hmm. and also as the interviewees mentioned in your package Kono I think it's a really great place for you to go on dates in a very mm -hmm. short amount of time not much money is needed you can look <laughs> at all the different entertainment exactly. options out there immerse yourself and I know that there's much more to your coverage. So why don't you walk us through on what you found out, which pop-up store you visited, and what your experience was like? Of course. So um, as you can see on the screen later on, mm -hmm. uh, there will be a pop-up store li like this on the screen right now. That's one of uh, the pop-up stores that I visited. Um, and uh, it really had a cool thing where I can actually um, ride a boat inside. <gasps> wow. And you can actually see it uh, later on. But um, also they have these fun things. You can actually have um, take these <laughs> merchandises from the pop-up stores because yeah. um, those pop-up stores are allowing these uh, customers to have fun experiences while consuming mm -hmm. products and that's why these uh, younger generations are called the so-called Fun consumers these oh, days, and as God. you can see on the screen, I'm riding on uh, riding a boat to. You look like you're having fun. Yeah. 
I did have a lot of fun. And not just that, but also, as Jessica mentioned, there's so many um, photo opportunities. Mm -hmm. There's special photo booths that mm -hmm. you can actually take four cut photos, which is a must-do thing among younger generations, generations in Korea <laughs> these days. And also, um, above all, I think uh, many photo spots, many Instagrammable photo mm -hmm. spots there, so that um, these MZers can actually take photos and then post them on um, socials, Instagram, and then they can actually receive many likes as possible. Mm. And I think this is a new play culture among these younger generations. Mm. It's a new play culture among the younger generation, aka fun consumers. <laughs> and as we're seeing in the video right now, that's a perfect coverage of you just really getting the full experience. Exactly. Riding not only a boat, but seeing different like Ferris wheels, like getting your own lottery ticket. Mm. It, it just seems so much fun. And yeah, if I may ask a mm. question, Connor, did you see a lot of young couples at these places? Yes, there were so many young couples um, also not just couples but their um, kids with their parents wow. and yeah, many young young people. There. Why ask Cheska? Because I feel like a lot of the reasons that a lot, it's very popular for mm. MCs, you kind of mentioned it, I think it is a great dating spot for young people. It is. It is. Because you get to do these fun interactive activities. I mean, I just saw them riding a boat yeah. in the middle of the city. I mean, how much more fun of a date can you have? Exactly. And we have to mention, it's quite affordable too. Some pop-up stores are free. Some you might have to buy a ticket or make pre-reservations mm -hmm. given that it's so popular. But personally for me, I love going to pop-up stores as like a dating location. <sighs> Because, you know, you want to ask your partner for a really cute picture. Yeah. You want to try out really new stuff nice. while not spending too much money. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the frequent yes. the dates are, you know, the money's going to keep going out of your wallet. I mean, you even get free gifts, like cute stickers, exactly. cosmetic yeah. products. Stickers. Yeah. Can you show yeah. our viewers the cute stickers, actually? <laughs> what more could you ask for? I know, these are something that would always be remnant in your memory. And exactly how popular is pop-up stores in Korea, we've covered that part. But to find out whether it is like that case in other parts of the world, we asked our viewers if pop-up stores have gained much traction in their respective countries. So take a look at the screen to find out what three of them had to share with us. Let's start with Benny. Benny said, pop-up stores are quite popular these days, especially when a K-pop group is introduced to our country. We had these before in some of the malls here. Found in Wonder said, I like to go to pop-up shops because you can find brands collaborating with popular characters. I think pop-up shops have become more popular since COVID because people don't have to travel far to find their favorite brands. Pop-up shops are a popular trend in Singapore for both businesses and consumers, they offer a win-win situation, providing affordable marketing opportunities for brands and exciting shopping experiences for customers. That was said by Leon. Now, we are, there are some problems overshadowing pop-up stores as well, though. As I mentioned, though, it might be an affordable dating option or an entertainment site for many consumers out there. I'm not sure whether that's the way a lot of brands want to go. So as a business correspondent here at Adirang Konu, why don't you walk us through the analysis behind the problems overlooked while launching a pop-up store? Sure. So before I tell you more, let's first take a listen to what a consumer science professor that I interviewed had to say. As these doors open for about two to three weeks, there's a lot of waste after they close. Also, the high cost of opening stores means a higher price for products. Yeah, so as the professor just mentioned, environmental issues is a huge issue going on these days, mm. especially because these pop-up stores, it takes a lot to build them, and then, uh, but they only use them for about a few weeks, mm -hmm. and sometimes even only for a few days. Yes. And it's uh, a lot of waste that comes out from these pop-up stores as soon as they close. And one other aspect was that um, since there's a lot of money invested, um, lots of financial uh, investment into these pop-up stores, mm -hmm that leads to um, these products getting more, much more expensive. Mm -hmm. So the consumers have to buy it at a more higher price than before. So that's the two main issues that I think is an issue going on these days. So there are downsides, not only for the brands that are launching these pop-up stores, but also for the consumers. And that's a mm -hmm. fascinating point, because if you think about it, in a consumer's perspective, you don't really think about what happens after the mm -hmm. pop-up period is done. Right. But now to say, if you think about the one that you went into, yes. you went on a boat, and there were so many different designs mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. I am quite curious as to how they're going to manage all that waste once the pop-up store period is done. Yeah, and I completely agree 
agree with you mm. on that note as well because I think environmental problem is quite real and this is not to disgrace the pop-up stores but if you think about it mm. as Kono mentioned these um, events only last for a couple of days and they have to be interesting and unique mm. meaning they can't be repeated again so once these pop-up stores or event take place everything that has been used has to be discarded or recycled and can never be repeated again so it's a very has a very limited shell you know shelf and display display life and you know when it comes to festivals or concert or any kind of promotional activities mm. I think there's a lot of physical waste that is produced that just can't be reused again mm -hmm. and I think in terms of pop-up stores also they have to um, you know print or create these promotional items mm -hmm. but they can't estimate how much you know or how many customers will come to give out so they always have to prepare in advance mm -hmm. and anything that's left again it can't be reused again so have to be discarded mm -hmm. you know when it comes to the gentrification issue also I th but I think there's a double side to it meaning yeah. I've visited some places that I would have never visited because of these pop-up stores mm -hmm. and there were actually some pop-up stores that did social engagement mm -hmm. to raise awareness for certain issues that became very effective so I think there's definitely the light and darkness to when it comes to pop-up store issues yeah exactly and hopefully we'll be able to shed light onto the overshadowed problems and I think that would really pave the way for us to better enjoy the pop-up store trend so what do you guys we think we need to do when it comes to better hopping onto this trend you know I mean I think it's a very effective way mm -hmm. to create engagement with consumers because when you're working at a company it's very hard to see your consumer you know face to face right. and especially since COVID I think it became very important so pop up store I think is a great fun way and as we saw for mm -hmm. MZ is to go on these fun dates however I do hope that we do take care of these problems such as environmental mm -hmm. or even like citywide issues so that it can actually have a more long-lasting impact yeah exactly mm -hmm. Kono what are your thoughts on this uh, I also uh, pretty much think the same as what Jessica just mentioned and also to add on I think it's important to actually diversify these um, pop-up stores with uh, several different concepts um, structures ways they operate them because um, many of these pop-up stores because uh, like there are about like hundreds of pop-up mm -hmm. stores opening and close monthly and but if it's all similar, these MZers might be too tired of it. Yeah, and mm, absolutely. So I think it's really important to actually diversify and come up with innovative um, thoughts, um, new and brilliant ideas mm. to make these um, Pablo stores more new and fresh to these customers. I think it must be an assignment for all those brands out there because mm. we're seeing Pablo stores become creative by the minute. Mm. But before I let you guys know, I, I'm quite curious. Yes. For me, I'm not that good of looking at all the different Pablo stores there. <laughs> I usually end up going going right after it's done. <laughs> so I always I always wonder when did everyone know? Like yes. how do people get the news mm. of pop-up stores? So is there any personal hacks you might have that you could share to our viewers oh. as to choosing the best pop-up store and how to get information? For me, one of the I I'm, I love that question. One of the things that I wanted to talk about right before we ended was that there are some pop-up stores that actually has a lot of social issues related mm. to it. There are some about like environmental friendly products, like vegan products, um, even some that are actually hosted by uh, NGO organizations mm -hmm. that when you really go you still get to do the activities for instance UNICEF right. had a pop-up store mm -hmm. and it was actually quite fun I went because I was one of the donors and they um, laid out some of the really fun activities but also they give you like a concise information kind of sessions mm -hmm. to learn more about the brand itself so I think when you're looking for pop-up stores I mean food is great it is. <laughs> hands amazing. down yes but if there is a particular issue that you're interested in I think it's a great idea sort of Google the brands mm. and see if they do a pop-up store so you can go and actually learn about the brand before you purchase something yeah. and we mentioned right before we went on air that you really liked learning about each I brand's do. history and I think pop-up stores give a really great opportunity they do yeah they spend a lot of money on that. they spend a <laughs> lot of money to inform consumers mm -hmm. out there now Kona what about you do you have any hacks as to finding the best pop-up store at the right time I do okay <laughs> and he does I, I can say for sure because I actually have like a Finsta uh -huh. uh, so that I can actually follow these um, brands <sighs> and um, there's actually some Instagram accounts that just shows you, tells you what pop-up store opens when That's and true. where. That's so true. I follow those kinds of accounts mm. through my Finsta and then whenever I access, um, have access to it, I can like 
swipe and then I can <laughs> yeah. see so many pop-up stores yeah. going on. So that's why I'm plenty of contents. He's, he's, <laughs> did you see his hand movement? I know, it was <laughs> very <laughs> generous. Yeah, he's very like visual right there. So you use social media. My last question then is, do you think these pop-up stores are beneficial? I understand that they're beneficial mm -hmm. for our generation. It's a huge entertainment source or an information yes. hub. Mm -hmm. But is it in the long run good for companies as well? Because I don't know about you guys, I find myself whenever I go to a pop-up store, I love the experience, I have so much fun, and whenever I go out to the streets, I remember that I saw a similar looking mm. bag or clothing, and I realized, oh, that's the thing from the pop-up store I saw earlier, so the promotional effect is definitely there. Yes. But I'm wondering whether you guys also have that in mind when visiting. That's a really great question, because one of the curiosity that I mm. have is, as we talked about it, um, I'm not so sure about the day of the pop-up store, whether mm. they do actually get increase in sales, because exactly. they actually give up more. Yeah. Yeah. to us than actually making sales. So I'm always happy to give their <laughs> gift package, but at the same time, I feel so bad. I'm, yeah. I'm not giving you anything. I didn't buy anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It feels like Christmas when I come out with these bags. So I'm, what I'm curious about is the after effect mm. of these branding of pop-up stores, whether after they have done a session of pop-up stores, right. whether the consumers actually grow mm. or the recognition of the brand image actually becomes more positive. Exactly. Because personally for me, when they have a good pop-up store with enough details and exhibitions. Mm. I even went to one, they had a personal curator oh. who would follow you and give you, you know, um, the history of the brand or like the story behind the product. I actually felt like a VIP guest, uh -huh. even though I was just visiting a pop-up store and right. learning about the product. So that really changed the idea that I had about the brand mm -hmm. in terms of the detail and the resources they were spending on it. You yeah. built brand loyalty. And Kono, I think you can answer this question because you covered it as a business correspondent. What would you have to say about that. Yes, so um, indeed these companies are investing a lot of money mm. into these pop-up stores, which might be a deficit after all. Mm. But I think, um, and the company side also told me that it's still uh, worth it because mm. they can actually uh, make a positive brand identity mm. and they can, in the long run, it's, it's still good because these customers get to know better about the brand mm. in more uh, detail. Yeah. Like so, someone like me who goes yes, and knows exactly. nothing about the brand starts yeah. out raising hands and asking question. <laughs> You're the perfect consumer rather than just using all the goodie bags and going on the events by using your social media. Actually learning about that company seems to be the way to go. Mm -hmm. And today we talked about the booming trend of pop-up stores here in Korea and hopefully it's beneficial to all sides whether it's the company or the consumers and for the general economy hopefully we'll see some positive changes there. Now in the meantime we'll be here every day from 9 30 to 10 a.m. Korea time bringing you more topics young people are talking about. Special thanks to Cheska Dine Hall. Pleasure is always mine. Thank you. And Pakun. My pleasure. All right, and thank you ever for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. We are News Generation.